Hello, good morning or good evening. Today I'll be talking about probably one of the most complex concept used in post-colonial studies, the figure of the subaltern. So in order to understand uh, the concept of the subaltern, of course, we have to go to its original source and which is the Italian Marxist uh, Antonio Gramsci, who uses the term for the first time in his book, which he recorded while in prison, and it is aptly called the prison notebooks. But a lot of people uh, believe that Gramsci uh, was actually using the term subaltern as a coded word so that his work would pass through uh, the prison censors instead of calling it the proletariat or giving it any other class designation. Uh, and hence, he was calling the people that he was referring to as the subaltern groups. But what's important to keep uh, in mind is that for uh, Gramsci, the subaltern groups were the groups, um, classes, and I'm reading his definition here from the prison notebooks. Uh, what he suggests is that the subaltern classes by definition are not unified and cannot unite until they are able to become a state. Their history, therefore, is intertwined with that of civil society and thereby with the history of states and groups of states. So even though they are not necessarily a viable class. What kind of gives them an essence is, is the very thing that they are kept divided or are divided and cannot become a constituency. And that is the group that he calls the subaltern groups. And then uh, he also comes up with kind of six stages uh, of how to study the subaltern groups. And those are the stages from the beginning of their history to uh, they coming to voice, right? But by and large, a subaltern group for Antonio Gramsci is a group that exists within a dominant hegemonic order, right? But has no place in it, no political space in it, whose um, views are not taken into account now, keep in mind when uh, Gramsci theorizes hegemony, what he basically suggests is that hegemony is established through a willing consent of the people, that people give a certain regime a right to rule, and those people of obviously constitute a class. Now, the subaltern classes would be outside of that hegemonic project. Their opinions are not even heard, right? And that to Gramsci is the subaltern group or a subaltern group. And so the project of politics maybe then is to bring them to voice or to record their histories or retrieve their histories because their history exists within the dominant history and is often silenced or erased. So the purpose of the project, a project to, um, you know, give the subalterns their voice, not give, but for them to claim it, they will then have to offer a competing history of their own groups, their own cultures, right? And that's where it becomes important for post-colonial studies is because if you see the larger structure of colonialism, there is always official history, mostly written by Europeans. So the first impulse in post-colonial struggles then is to retrieve your own history, right? and then posit it against the dominant history of Europeans. But there is a catch, and that is where Ranajit Guha and the subaltern studies group come in, because what they argue, let's say, within the context of India, that even after independence, the Indian historiography is mainly bourgeois historiography, mainstream historiography, which tells the stories of the bourgeois classes 
right? And which still doesn't account for the subaltern histories, histories of the silenced people, histories of the voteless people, people who might be uh, outside of caste, people who don't belong to the dominant classes. So the entire project of subaltern studies then is the retrieval of those silenced histories and recording of those silenced histories. And if you have looked at looked at the works produced by Subaltern Studies Collective, you know, there are 10 volumes of it right behind me on that shelf. So for Ranajit Guha and the Subaltern Studies group, the project then is to bring the narratives and the stories and the histories of silenced classes, isolated classes, record them, and juxtapose them with the dominant history, which has excluded them. Okay, now what we are learning from this then is that the subaltern groups, they can be collectivities and they can exist as groups, but maybe they either, if we go by Gramsci, do not have a politics or a political voice. And in most cases, we tend to assume subaltern status as almost essential, in almost essential terms. And that is why the when we read Spivak can the subaltern speak, it's very hard for us to understand as to what is it that she's suggesting. Now, I will do a longer uh, lecture on can the subaltern speak itself, but here, just a few uh, points about it. The first thing to keep in mind in, is that in that essay, what Spivak is challenging is an assertion made by Guise Deleuze in one of his interviews, where he says representation has withered away and, and people can speak for themselves, right? That is the point that she's contesting in Can the Subaltern Speak? Because what her point is, that both Foucault and Deleuze can say that because they are not keeping in mind the global division of labor, where the metropolitan centers hold all the power and labor intensive jobs have gone to the developing world. And if you elide that, then you can posit that people have come to power and they can speak for themselves. And the role of the intellectual is to relay that knowledge to the powers that be, right? And so what she's trying to suggest in that is that we need a general theory of ideology, which reminds us constantly of the global division of labor. And two, that the intellectual must not give up on the job of politically representing the subaltern classes. That, that there is a danger in assuming that the subaltern classes have come to voice. And that is where she employs a, a certain kind of strategic essentialism, which she later, you know, says that what she is not an essentialist, but that that for a subaltern to be a subaltern, a subaltern has to be voiceless, has to lack political power. And it's that condition that renders a group or an individual into a subaltern. And so that's there is a certain degree of essentialism involved over there. And then within uh, the subaltern studies group, uh, you know, there are also... Uh, arguments that one group, and Spivak herself says that in her introduction, I think, to one of the uh, excerpted volumes of subaltern studies, that depending on where you are, your location, let's say within India or Pakistan, regionally, the subaltern groups can shift. You could be a subaltern group in one part of the nation, but you could be a dominant group in another part of the nation. So there is no universally attributable subaltern status that can be assigned to someone. Now for Spivak, the ultimate subaltern subject is the figure of the subaltern woman, right? Who is placed in this position through global capital, but also through local customs. So within even a subaltern group, the figure of the woman, you know, costless woman, women from the rural parts of India and Pakistan, they become the ultimate subaltern because not only are they controlled within the public sphere, but their 
voice is also controlled within the domestic or home sphere, right? So overall, the concept itself comes from Antonio Gramsci, right? Who, according to some sources, uses the term subaltern to avoid using the term proletariat. But it takes a life of its own because he starts discussing the subaltern classes in his work and, and attributes to them certain things that they are not part of the hegemonic order, their voices are not heard, and maybe their consent is not sought right within a given regime. Then the concept is appropriated and redefined by Ranajit Guha and other people of subaltern studies group, who then within the field of Indian historiography take it upon themselves to retrieve, record, and render in writing, in speech, the silenced histories of the subaltern groups. And then the biggest debate launches when Spivak writes her, can the subaltern speak? And within that, as I said, her, uh, her main effort is not necessarily to define what makes a subaltern, but that assuming that the subaltern can know his or her place and has come to voice, has certain attendant dangers, and that the critics post-colonial critics and scholars must not make that assumption and then give up on their responsibility to stand in solidarity with the subaltern groups and make an attempt to politically and otherwise represent them. Now, there are certain mistakes we make. Usually, you know, we kind of um, equate subaltern status with being oppressed and all. So you could sometimes you, I, I have heard people living in the metropolitan cultures, right? Having great jobs in academia and elsewhere, but simply because they are a ethnic or racial minority, they think of themselves as a subaltern group. And that in my opinion is, is a misuse of the term because their location still compared to their global counterparts is a privileged position and that they have political voice. They can vote, they can organize with other groups. So to sum up, you know, a very complicated debate as a group or as an individual, if you have no say in how you are governed, if no one seeks your consent, if your voice is not heard if no one reaches out to you to seek your consent to govern you, right? And if you are kept outside the promise of national economy, national civic society, if you cannot claim the status of a political class, then you are a subaltern and you're a part of a subaltern group. So these are some of the things you should keep in mind. I know it's a pretty complex concept. I hope this was a little bit of a help. I will put some additional resources in description for you to read. There is a wonderful article on the history of the concept by uh, uh, Al Habib Luai. Uh, he happens to be my Facebook friend too. Uh, so I'll post a link to that article as well. And you know, if you have any questions, if you like me to explain further, please uh, do um, comment and post your questions there. And if you would like to stay updated about what I do next, please do subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you next time. <music>